It is good to be with you tonight. I hope everyone is doing well. I am recording this while I am still out of town visiting my sister near Port Angeles, Washington. I'm here where I've been camping all week at Heart of the Hills, which is a campground in Olympic National Park. And Port Angeles is right on the Strait of Juan de Fuca, which is the body of water that comes in from the Pacific Ocean heading over to Seattle. So there's a lot of shipping traffic along there. And Port Angeles is a beautiful little town. I've enjoyed being here for the week, enjoyed being with my sister. Uh, Heart of the Hills is in Olympic National Park, about five miles up the road from Port Angeles, and my sister lives a few blocks from the entrance to the park, so five miles north of here. It's kind of strange to me that here you go south to get colder. In Wisconsin, I'm accustomed to going north to get colder, but of course here the mountains are to the south, and so most of the year you can just go south if you want it a little bit cooler, so I'm up here at a little over 1800 feet hurricane ridge is at the end of this 1700 uh, or 17 mile road and they are roughly 5200 uh, feet above sea level so i went up there a few days ago to try to record class and it was absolutely too windy there is a reason why they called it hurricane ridge the wind was howling uh, I have a special filter on the microphone to try to cut out some of the wind noise after the experience we had at Governor Dodge State Park a few weeks ago. Uh, but even with that, it was just uh, deafening up there on top of the uh, on top of the ridge. But it's been good to be camping here. It's been cool. I think right now it's in the low 40s. I can see my breath. I got a campfire going over here. Hope that's not too distracting. But I have just uh, enjoyed the trip. I may try to tip the laptop back just a little bit so you can see a little bit of what I'm experiencing here, some of the trees. Didn't want to make anybody too seasick there or anything, but uh, just a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, be sure to send me any prayer requests, any updates to the bulletin, anything you want to let me know about that we need to be concerned about. Uh, let me know by phone or by text at 608-224-0274. If you have internet access or email access, feel free to give me an email. Uh, send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. If there's anything that we as a church can do to help or encourage you or to pray for you in any way, I hope you'll let us know and get in touch right away. Uh, please also remember that we're meeting for worship every Sunday for two worship services, one of two services, one at 9, one at 1030. Please remember to sign up ahead of time using the Sign Up Genius. If you're from the Madison area, I hope to see you on Sunday. I know it's very tempting with the shortened service to say, ah, it's not worth it, not worth the trip over there or whatever. But it has been such an encouragement to me over the past seven months or so to be able to be with all of you between the services and after the service. Uh, just a wonderful time of Christian fellowship. It is a lot more than just the half an hour we spend in the building for worship, but it's so good to get together, especially during these times that we're in. Uh, there is a danger in getting disconnected from our Christian family, and we certainly don't want that to happen. Uh, we wear masks in the building, we're spreading it out, we're keeping our building limited to 25% of capacity, and so there is a lot of room to spread out. If you're, it's still too crowded for you for some reason, feel free to go downstairs. We have a large monitor set up down there with a live stream on it, and then you can take advantage of that, partake of the Lord's Supper with us, and then join us outside for some Christian fellowship. I'm very thankful to Josh Yancey for teaching for me in the Wednesday class over the past several weeks. I've only seen two of his classes so far. One is still to come from my perspective time-wise since I'm recording this ahead of time. So it's a little strange to thank somebody ahead of time for something they've already done by the time you see this. So we'll just add that to the list of strange things that have happened over the past several months. And I'm also thankful, obviously, to Aaron and to John for teaching or uh, for preaching on Sunday morning. Uh, nevertheless, tonight we are continuing our pause in studying the book of Luke, and I'm hoping we can look at several tools or resources for teaching others. Some tools that we've used throughout the years, there are some very good tools or resources for teaching outsiders. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Jewel Miller film strips. Those were very popular, probably in the 60s, 70s, early 80s. I remember going on visits with my dad, studying with people in that way. And there would be the little record player and the film strip machine and you'd bring the screen to study in somebody's living room. It was the, the whole thing there. And I remember being responsible sometimes for listening for the ding on the record player and that was the signal to advance the film strip to the next slide or whatever. But uh, those have been very popular through the years, very productive for the Lord. 
Uh, they've actually digitized the Jewel Miller film strips, and so I have those on a thumb drive now. Hopefully when we get back together in our building as a church, we're not licensed copyright-wise to share those through the live stream. So I'm hoping when we get back in the building, we're able to go through those. But some very good material. A lot of other good resources for teaching the gospel to people. Uh, personally, through the years, it's obviously possible to just go through a book of the Bible. If somebody wants to know more about Jesus, let's sit down and study the book of Mark. One chapter a week, and we'll work through it a little bit at a time. We learn more about the Lord, only 16 chapters, and it's doable. Uh, from time to time, though, I find it uh, very helpful to have some kind of notes. And so, the gospel is so important, my memory isn't perfect, and so I want some kind of a guide in order to not forget anything because this is a very important subject as we're teaching people the gospel and so through the years we've developed a series of worksheets uh, guiding our thoughts through some of the studies that we want to do with people and a lot of times it's good just to start with somebody and ask them where are you on your spiritual journey what do you know right now what is your history with the christian faith and see if they have any questions see if they have any objections and handle it in that way uh, in my mind, there is a progression to a study of the gospel. There, there are a series of steps, a series of things that we need to come to understand before we move on to the next step. Uh, we start, for example, with belief in God. If somebody doesn't even believe in God, there's really no sense in pointing to a verse in the New Testament and saying, this verse says you need to be baptized, because obviously that doesn't matter. If you don't even believe in God, uh, we're not at that step yet. And so if somebody really doesn't believe in the existence of God, a lot of times I've tried to direct them to good resources that we have available to us, apologeticspress.org, uh, written by some scientific type people and uh, some good Christian brothers with PhDs and master's degrees in uh, apologetics and science and biology and, and physics and so on. And they have some good uh, articles about the existence of God and creation versus evolution, that kind of thing. So that's a good way to start. Uh, sometimes if somebody really doesn't believe in God, there's some reason for it. There's some objection that they have. The perceived cruelty of God in the Old Testament. And so we may want to start with an article from Apologetics Press or Christian Courier or something like that that may address some of those concerns and go from there. Once somebody believes in the existence of God, it seems to me the next logical step would be to come to an understanding that Jesus is the Son of God. And that's obviously a critical a step, a critical uh, understanding to have, and so we progress from the existence of God to the belief in God, and then to the belief in Jesus as his son. And so, you know, there are some things that we could consider there, some possibilities we can study, we can look at the New Testament for some evidence and some eyewitness accounts. And then somewhat tied to this, we need to see whether the person believes that the Bible is the inspired word of God. That seems to be the next logical step after believing in God and believing in his son Jesus. It's coming to an understanding that the Bible really is his word and that the Bible is perfect. And we could look at scientific and medical foreknowledge, the fulfillment of prophecy, the miraculous unity of the Bible, some steps that we can look at there. And then once we've come through those three steps, the existence of God, the belief in his son Jesus, the belief in the Bible as his word, then it's a matter of what the Bible actually teaches. And so only when somebody believes in God and believes in the Bible, can we really go to the Bible itself and apply it to our situation today? So I hope this process makes sense. I can't go to an atheist and say, you need to believe in God because Genesis 1-1 says that there is a God. That doesn't make sense because he doesn't really care about the Bible in the first place. So that's kind of the progression that we need to go through. Uh, over the next few weeks, I want us to look at some tools for handling some of the most common needs that I have personally run into, scripturally speaking, through the years studying with people. Generally speaking, if somebody comes to me to study, they already believe in God. They usually believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and they're often pretty much squared away uh, concerning their belief in the Bible as the inspired Word of God. And so with that in mind, if we come through those basic steps, it's often good for us just to go back to Jesus, to learn more about the Lord, look at the Lord to make sure we know really who he is. Before we talk about obeying the Lord, let's make sure that we know and understand exactly who the Lord really is. So tonight, I hope we can look at a worksheet. Um, and the first study here is a worksheet that we've developed through the years, Learn From Me. And there's a picture of a yoke on it there. 
I'll try to put some kind of a link in the description if I can, or maybe send out an email uh, with the PDF version of this worksheet so you can have it to work through as we go through class tonight. That would be the ideal situation. If you want a hard copy after the fact, uh, feel free to give me a call. I'd be glad to send you one in the mail. But we want to go through this worksheet tonight with the goal of getting familiar with it in case we'd like to use it with somebody who wants to learn more about the Lord. And the title obviously comes from a passage in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, where Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so the idea is Jesus has invited us to come to him and to take his yoke upon us. And so before we come to him, before we take any kind of yoke on us, before we bear any burden, we need to know who it is who is making this request. We need to know who the Lord is. So in this passage, he's inviting us to join with him, to yoke up with the Lord. And he's using a visual that we might not really be too familiar with. Most of us are not very familiar with a yoke. Maybe we've seen it. Maybe we are a little bit familiar, but uh, most of us don't use this in our everyday lives. A uh, yoke, of course, is a kind of harness, uh, usually used for plowing or maybe uh, hauling a cart of some kind using animals, usually oxen, maybe donkeys, maybe horses. And as you can see from the diagram on the screen there, if you're able to join us online, there is a crossbar, there is an attachment point in the middle, and then there are at least two loops of some kind that go down around the necks of the animals that are harnessed up for this purpose. This is a picture of an actual yoke. About a year ago, I saw one of these at Habitat Restore uh, over on Monona Drive. It was very tempting to get it for this lesson, but it was pretty expensive. I don't know, $50, $75, something like that. And I thought, hmm, that'd be interesting. I could bring this to church. I could show them what a yoke really is. And then I thought about the cost, and I thought, nope, that's not going to work. And so a picture will have to do. But I'm guessing somebody might have purchased this at some point for a decoration, maybe hang it on the wall in the living room or something like that. But at least we have a picture here so we can see uh, what a yoke looks like. Then we have a picture of a yoke in action, and here the animals are being used to pull a cart or a wagon or whatever it is. I'm not even exactly sure what kind of animals those are. Uh, we might remember from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul uses similar imagery as he says, Do not be bound together with or unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness and he's making the point do not allow yourselves to be dragged along by the neck into sin and so as you interact with the world don't allow yourselves to get pulled away from the lord and i know we've discussed this before but we can imagine what might happen if we were to have a great dane and a chihuahua yoked together in some way Imagine teaming those two animals together to go out and do some, thump, something. Imagine uh, taking those two animals for a walk together. That right there would be a challenge enough in and of itself. Obviously, the chihuahua would get dragged along by the neck. I mean, I, I've known some chihuahuas with attitude, so maybe not. They may be able to dominate there. But I think we understand the issue there. Do not allow yourselves to get dragged into sin by a, a friend, a partner, a spouse, a business associate, or whatever. And so that's the picture Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 6 14. Well, back in Matthew 11, Jesus is inviting us to join him in his yoke because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I want to point out there as we get going that there is a burden, isn't there? There is some kind of burden involved in living the Christian life. However, we find here in this passage that his burden is light. It certainly beats the alternative. The burden of sin is heavy. The burden that Jesus offers, though, is light. And he says that his yoke is easy. His yoke is comfortable. We know that Jesus was a carpenter for most of his adult life. And so it's possible, then, that Jesus might have made and designed and produced yokes at some point. And we can imagine that uh, the benefits of having a well-designed, well-fitting yoke uh, would be obvious. 
and we can imagine the benefits of that. We might compare it today to having shoes that properly fit. What a huge difference there is between having a good pair of shoes that fit well and a pair of shoes that are too tight. A proper fit makes all the difference in the world. And so that's the kind of yoke that Jesus is offering to us. And so with this in mind, by way of background, I want us to go through the worksheet with the goal of being ready to use this sheet to introduce somebody to Jesus using the Word of God. And, and again, certainly we could just go through the book of Mark, we could read through the book of John or whatever, and we may do that at some point with, a, with an outsider who wants to know more. Um, but tonight we're using a series of scriptures from various places as a way of summarizing who Jesus is and what he has to offer using the picture of a yoke. We have Jesus on one side of the yoke, and then we're being invited to join him on the other. And before we accept that offer of joining him in the yoke, we need to know exactly who Jesus is. For the purpose of our study tonight, we'll zoom in. So you'll notice on the worksheet, I've zoomed in to question number one or scripture number one here, and I'll put the text underneath it, and then we'll fill in the blank to the right. So I would invite you to do that with me if you have that printed out and just write a few words summarizing what we learn about Jesus from the passage that we read. But we start with Hebrews 1 verses 1 through 4. The book of Hebrews was actually written by an anonymous author. It seems to have been perhaps a sermon or a time or two in the book where he says, time will fail me if I say this or that. And so that's not really a restriction you have when you're writing a letter. And so he seems to be perhaps giving a sermon. And so it's a sermon perhaps that was written down and he seems to be preaching to or communicating with a group of Christians who came out of Judaism and are tempted to go back to the Jewish faith because Christianity is starting to be persecuted. And so the theme of the book of Hebrews is Jesus is better. And obviously that's what Josh has been teaching over the past several Wednesday evenings. So to introduce the book, uh, this is how the author starts. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. So looking back at this passage, I would ask, what do we learn about Jesus? And if we're studying through this worksheet with somebody who wants to know about Jesus, we're letting them answer this question. Based on these four verses, what do we learn about the Lord here? What do we learn about Jesus? Well, we learn that although God spoke in many different ways in times past, in these last days, God has spoken to us through his son. And so we might compare and contrast. In the Old Testament, God spoke through um, handwriting on a wall. He spoke through the writing on a tablet of stone with the Ten Commandments. Uh, he spoke through a donkey as he did with Balaam and so on. In these last days, God though has spoken to us through his son. And so we might write in the blank here that Jesus is God's spokesperson. Jesus is God's representative. Jesus is God's communicator. We also learn here that Jesus is the exact representation of God's nature. And so if you want to learn about God, if you want to know about God, look at Jesus. Study about Jesus in the Word. We learn that Jesus upholds everything by the Word of His power. And so we learn there that He is all-powerful. He holds everything together uh, with His Word. The Word of Jesus is powerful. We also learn that Jesus is currently seated at God's right hand. That is a position of great honor. It's a position of glory and power. We also learn that Jesus is better than the angels. And he continues on, of course, in this book, uh, in the rest of chapter 1, developing that theme. Uh, on the screen, I'm putting my summary of this in the blanks. Yours might look a little bit different than this. If we were studying with somebody... Uh, we would encourage them to do this on their own. We're not giving them the answers, uh, but we're studying this together. We're coming to a mutual understanding from Scripture of who Jesus is and helping them to understand uh, who the Lord is. Okay, let's move on to the second one on the worksheet here, which is John 14, verses 6 through 11. 
And when we study with somebody, it's usually good to have them read the passage in their own Bible, if at all possible. Uh, if they don't have a Bible of their own, we can certainly give them one. Uh, sometimes when we study at the church building, there's a value to all using the same edition of the Bible, so it's all on the same page. So if they're having a hard time finding Hebrews or John or 1 John, uh, we can get there first and we can tell them it's on page 1400, whatever. And so there is a value to that. Now, the purpose of John's book is to encourage belief in Jesus as the Son of God. So John is a very good book for introducing people to Jesus. So let's look at John 14, verses 6 through 11. And as we read, let's keep an eye out for what we learn about the Lord here. John 14, 6 through 11. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. And so as we look over these verses, as we summarize this passage, what do we learn about Jesus here? If we know nothing about Jesus other than what's in this passage, what would we know? Well, we learn from the opening verses here that Jesus is the only way to the Father. That's significant. That's huge. That's a very important lesson to learn. Jesus is the only way. We also learn that to know Jesus is to know the Father. And so if you want to know the Father, get to know Jesus. Study his life. Look at his life. Look at the eyewitness accounts of his life. We learn that the words Jesus speaks are words that the Father has supplied. And doesn't that mesh with what we learned from Hebrews chapter 1, that Jesus is God's spokesperson? A very similar concept here. And we learn that Jesus works encourage belief. That's something else we see in this passage. That should cause us to start looking again at the eyewitness accounts of some of the amazing things that Jesus did when he was here. And again, we should be summarizing this as we go along, filling in these blanks. It might look something like this for you. This is my summary of what I learned about Jesus in this paragraph. It may look different for different people. But John then gives some very important information about Jesus. Uh, the next passage actually comes from earlier in John. So let's look back at John chapter 1 verses 1 through 5, and then also verse 14. Uh, verses 6 through 13 are really about John the Baptist or John the Immerser, so we're skipping over those, but we're reading the verses about Jesus. John 1, 1 through 5, and then verse 14. Let's keep an eye out for what we learn about the Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then skipping down to verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So what do we learn about Jesus in these verses? Well, we learn that Jesus is described here as being the Word. Jesus is the Word of God. Many years ago, one of the good Christian brothers at the congregation was praying on a Sunday morning, and, and I, I thought he might have had a slip of the tongue. It might or might not have been now. I don't know. But he said something to the effect of, God, we have come here this morning to, to worship your Word. And, and I thought, wait, he didn't really mean to say that, did he? And then the more I thought about it, I thought, that is incredibly accurate. That's exactly what we've come here to do. We are indeed worshiping the Word of God when we come together as a Christian family every Lord's Day. Because Jesus is the Word, isn't he? And so, yes, we do, in fact, worship Jesus as the Word of God. We also learn something here, that Jesus existed in the beginning. And that is significant. He was not created. He has always been. He was here when everything began. We learned that the Word was with God and the Word was God. In other words, Jesus is God. And that's huge. Jesus is deity. 
we learn here that everything was created through Jesus. Jesus is the creator. Remember how everything was created back in Genesis? How did God create? He spoke it into existence, didn't he? Again, the word of God. Jesus is the word, and as the word, Jesus is the creator. We learn here that Jesus is the light, and that's a significant fact that we learn here in John 1. We learn also in verse 14 that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So God, the Word, came to this earth in human form as Jesus. And again, we put these things out there in the blank to the right of number three, just summarizing what we learn about the Lord. If I'm thinking about taking on Jesus' yoke, these are some things that I want to know. These are some things that I think would make that, light, that, that burden easier to bear if we really understand who He is. Let's move on to number four then, and we continue with Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. And again, looking at these verses, what do we learn about Jesus? Colossians 1, 13 through 17. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So we learn here that as his followers, Jesus has saved us, hasn't he? He has rescued us from the domain of darkness. In this process, God has also transferred us into the kingdom of his Son. And so the kingdom belongs to God's Son, Jesus. In Jesus, we have redemption in the Lord. If we're in Christ, we have redemption. This is significant. We have the forgiveness of sins. To redeem is to buy back. We've learned this recently in our study of blood uh, on Sunday morning a few weeks ago. Jesus has purchased us with his blood. We've been redeemed. In verse 15, we find that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Very similar to what we see in John. If we've seen Jesus, we've seen the Father. In verse 16, we see again that by Jesus, all things were created. This is a common theme. It's come up several times already tonight. In verse 17, Jesus comes first. He is before and above all other things. And once again, we find that Jesus holds everything together. And again, we may put this in summary over there in the blank to the right of number four. Uh, just putting in our own words what we learn about the Lord in this passage. Okay, let's keep moving to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, going back to Hebrews. Hebrews tells us a lot about Jesus. Remember, the whole theme, Jesus is better, and so we would expect this preacher, this author, to tell us more about the Lord. So let's look at Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, keeping an eye out for what we learn about the Lord. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In this passage, we learn Jesus is our high priest. And as Josh taught just a few weeks ago, a high priest is a go-between, somebody who bridges the gap between God and the human race. Jesus fills that role perfectly. We learn the reason for this, and that is he can sympathize with our weaknesses. Literally, he can feel with us. He feels alongside us. He feels what we feel. Uh, he's been tempted just as we are. And all of this allows us to approach the throne of grace with confidence. We can go to God knowing that he'll listen because Jesus is there. And once again, we put a summary of this on our sheet as we move through this. So let's keep going to number six here, which is Hebrews chapter two, verses 17 and 18. In terms of knowing who Jesus is, there's a bit more here. Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. So what do we learn about the Lord here? We learn that by coming to this earth and living for 33 and a half years, Jesus became like his brethren. Again, as our high priest, he understands. He knows what we're going through. 
We also learn here that Jesus made propitiation for our sins. He died in our place. The word propitiation refers to an atoning sacrifice, a sacrifice that make, makes things okay between us and God. We also learn that Jesus being tempted allows him to come to our aid uh, when we're tempted. Again, he can empathize with us, a thought that we've seen previously in Hebrews. And so again, uh, we summarize these thoughts in our own words in the blank there or allow the person we're studying with to do this as we do it ourselves before we move on to the next passage. All right, let's go back to one of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Matthew 26, 36 through 39. This is a scene from the night before Jesus dies. And we'll go through this passage, keeping an eye out for what else we learn about the Lord here. Matthew 26, 36 through 39. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So what do we learn about the Lord here? We learn that Jesus could suffer emotionally, couldn't he? He could be grieved. He could be distressed. This was difficult. He knew what was coming, and it really affected him personally in a deep emotional way. We also learn that Jesus had friends that he could lean on, didn't he? He had a close inner circle of friends, uh, Peter, and then the two sons of Zebedee. In other passages, we know them as James and John. And so we summarize all this in the blanks here and put our thoughts there, uh, what we can learn about Jesus from number seven here. All right, let's move on to number eight, which is back in Hebrews. So Hebrews 5, verses 7 through 9. Hebrews 5, 7 through 9. Keeping an eye out for what we learn about the Lord. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with a loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. So what do we learn? What do we put in the blank here? We learn that Jesus wept, didn't he? He cried. Again, he experienced human emotion. As we've studied recently, we have a record of Jesus weeping at least three times during his ministry. At the death of Lazarus, his good friend, we, we remember him. <laughs> Pardon me there, it's getting windy out here. So he wept over the death of his friend Lazarus. He wept over the city of Jerusalem in the book of Luke and the coming destruction. We learned that a few weeks ago on a Wednesday evening. And then he weeps here over in Hebrews. We don't know exactly what this refers back to. Uh, probably it goes back to the night before he died or maybe even on the cross itself. We also discover here that Jesus learned obedience. He learned this by experience, not that he didn't no obedience before, but he learned this in a personal way. He experienced the need for it. He knows what it means because he's been through it. We also learn that Jesus will save those who obey him. He'll save, but he won't save everybody. He wants to save everybody, but the other part of that's up to us. He saves those who obey, and that's a key point to learn here. Uh, Jesus saves those who will obey him. And so we put this uh, in a summary on the worksheet here before we move on. Uh, to number nine. All right, let's go on to number nine then. Hebrews chapter seven, verse 25. Hebrews seven twenty-five. Therefore, he is also able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So what do we learn? What do we put in the blank? We learn that Jesus saves those who draw near to God through him. And again, going back to John 14, Jesus is the only way to God. We have to draw near to God through the Lord Jesus. We also learn that Jesus makes intercession for us. I don't think we've really covered that in our class yet tonight. To intercede is to step in and to plead on someone else's behalf, to make a request. And Jesus does this for us. And so we summarize this in the best, we, uh, best way we can uh, in the blank on the worksheet there in our own words. Okay, let's go on to number 10, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. 1 John is toward the end of the New Testament. 1 John 2, 1 and 2, keeping an eye out for what we learn about Jesus. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. 
My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. What do we learn here? We learn Jesus is our advocate. The word here literally refers to someone we call to our side, someone you want by your side, someone to put their arm around you, someone you can lean on for support. And this is the word that goes back to a word that was normally used for an attorney in the New Testament times, a counselor, a lawyer, someone who would represent you in court. Uh, as I see it, when we stand before God the Father in judgment, Jesus is our lawyer. He is our representative. He is our attorney. If you've ever needed a lawyer, then you may know the value of having a good one. If you need one, you want a good one. Uh, the first house we bought uh, was for sale by owner, and there wasn't a real estate agent involved for that reason. So uh, it had been a rental house. The owners were selling it by owner. We were still students, not even married yet. We were college students in Tennessee, moving up to Wisconsin in May. Now the wind is really picking up here. And this was over Christmas break. We found the house in Janesville for sale. And so we found an attorney to represent us, basically purchasing that house through the uh, fax machine at the Freed Hardeman Library, had a closing over spring break, and that man represented us very well, told us when it was okay and not okay or whatever to sign all the papers. And I think we paid him $178, some of the best money that we've ever spent, but he was our representative. And we learn here, Jesus is our attorney. He is our lawyer. We also learn here that Jesus is righteous. We have another reminder that Jesus is also our propitiation, a payment for sin, and that Jesus makes intercession for us. To intercede is to step in and to plead on someone else's behalf, to make a request, and Jesus does this for us. And again, we note this on the sheet and summarize in our own words before we move on to number 11. So let's look at number 11. This is John 13, verses 12 through 17. John 13, 12 through 17. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to him, them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. So what do we put in the blank? What do we learn? We learn Jesus is a servant. That's a huge lesson to learn. He is a servant. He washes his disciples' feet. He does whatever it is that needs to be done. Nothing is beneath him. And then also notice, he calls on his disciples to follow his example. He's not necessarily starting some kind of new religious ritual. This isn't some ceremony that we need to do, the, the washing of feet, as some religious groups do. But he's teaching here, we do what needs to be done, and we follow his example in doing that. All right, let's move on to number 12. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, keeping an eye out for what we learn about the Lord here. 1 John 2, 3 through 6. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So what do we learn? What do we put in the blank here, the summary? We know that if we know Jesus, we obey his commandments. And if we don't keep his man commandments but claim to follow him, we're lying. We also know when we keep his word, God's love has been perfected in us. And we also learn that if we claim to abide in him, we'd better be living like he did, loving and serving those around us. So we summarize that, putting that in our own words on the worksheet. And with this, we get back to where we uh, started tonight. Jesus is offering us a place in his yoke. But before we accept that position in the yoke, we need to know who he is. We need to know who's making that offer. And tonight we've learned something about the Lord. And, and I know this is not primarily for our benefit in this class. We've been looking at this as a tool uh, for teaching those who don't know these things. This is some structure. Uh, this is a sheet that we can go through guiding our thoughts as we teach people about the Lord. Hopefully that will be helpful in some way. Again, 
If you want a hard copy of this, I'd be glad to drop that in the mail for you. Uh, if you have something that needs to be added to this, some other good information about the Lord, if you see something that needs to be corrected, uh, please let me know. I, I've updated this numerous times through the years as we've gone through it with people. Uh, those that we've studied with have given good additions and good suggestions here, but if you have anything to add or correct, uh, I would love to hear about it. Thank you so much uh, for being with us tonight. I hope you're doing well. I'm looking forward to being back in Madison. Hopefully I am by the time this goes out and is broadcast. Uh, but as we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, creator of heaven and earth, creator of everything that we see around us. Thank you for the relationship that we have with your son, Jesus. We're thankful for your word and for the opportunity we've had to study tonight. Thank you for making a way for us to come back to you. We have sinned, we fall far, far short of your glory. And so we're thankful for your grace and for your mercy and for your book that tells us what we need to do. We pray tonight that we might be more like Jesus, your son. We want to learn from him. We want to be like him. We know from experience that his yoke truly is easy. His burden is light. Bless those of us as we live for him. Give us opportunities to share your love with this world. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, at his request and by his authority. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Lord, come quickly. Amen.